Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode three of Uniquely Human. Dave Finch and I are just so pleased that you're joining us. We hope you've joined us for the previous podcast, but if you haven't, you could still go back to uniquelyhuman.com. Today, we just have a terrific episode, and I'm just so excited that we have our esteemed guest, Steve Silberman, and we will have a wonderful discussion about enthusiasms. Yes. Uh, Apropos of the topic at hand, I am we'll say beyond neurotypical levels of enthusiasm for today's episode. Um, you know, enthusiasms are, are what I tend to refer to as special interests um, are an interesting thing for those of us on the spectrum. And in many ways for the neurotypicals who have to nay get to <laughs> spend time with us. Um, I can tell you that in my own adult life, my wacko assortment of enthusiasms have driven me to some major personal achievements and uh, frankly have driven away what could have been some some profound friendships Uh, it's 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 a mixed bag and uh, we'll get to all that in a second Uh, first though uh, dude steve silberman right um man of a thousand s's suspenders smiles sarcasm (laughs) scientifically savvy sublime sweet sincere sitting on Zoom waiting for me to get on with it. (laughs) Uh, Steve, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, You know, we all love Neurotribes, obviously, which I feel is something of a companion book to Uniquely Human, uh, for no other reason than you can't put either one of these books down uh, once you start reading them. Thank you. I'm honored to be here, and I'm very honored to be with Barry. And it's funny that you described uh, Neurotribes as a companion book to Uniquely Human, What happened when I saw Barry's book was that I said to myself, oh my God, I wrote the history and then Barry from the front lines of working with autistic people and their families wrote the applied history in a sense. Like the the lessons that could be gleaned from autism history in neurotribes were applied by Barry uh, in, in real life, you know? So whenever, whenever parents, like, as they often do, like, say to me, oh, okay, I read Neurotribes, so what do I do now? I say, read Uniquely Human. <laughs> when did when did you start in autism, Barry? I started at summer camps in um, 1968. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yep, you, you were definitely, uh, you know, the, the old school, but with new school thinking. <laughs> and uh, I could tell that you were a very authentic and compassionate person and i was it was really a delight to get to know you and then we hung out in new orleans my only time i've ever been there galatoire um, and, yeah exactly <laughs> we had amazingly heart clogging <laughs> food at galatoire <laughs> yeah, yeah. but uh, but yeah uh, i i i love barry and i i often refer uh parents to his a retreat, parents retreat, mm-hmm. um, which I've heard is wonderful. And Dave has been there, yeah. Oh, cool. I think one of the things that made me feel a very strong bond to Steve, and I'll never forget this, when we sat down at that little table in that little, uh, wonderful little courtyard restaurant. and Which, by the way, was, uh, I described that cafe in the introduction to Neurotribes as the inception place for me getting involved in autism. We were sitting feet away from where a woman blurted out in in the year 2000, oh my God, there's an epidemic of autism in Silicon Valley. You know, which there wasn't, (laughs) by the way. Right, right, there wasn't. Geeks everywhere. (laughs) Right, right. But I spent the next, you know, 20 years of my life or whatever, um, you know, uh, like figuring out what was right and what was wrong about her comment. But That's we were right. sitting feet away from that <laughs> the same table where that conversation happened, Barry. Yes, yeah, and and uh, st- and maybe for me this was an incredible comment that you made, so it was a little earth shattering. Steve says to me, you know, and at that time, Neurotribes had been published, and everybody was going, "Oh my God, you must read Neurotribes." Um, and Steve yeah. said to me, "I want to make it clear, I am not an autism expert. I'm a science writer," uh-huh. and I think I said. I want to make it clear. I'm not an autism expert. I'm not on the spectrum. 
<laughs> oh yes, right. And that and yeah. that yeah, was very, a real yeah. a real bond that we both felt that and I think it's emulated beautifully in neurotribes and hopefully in uniquely human, that all of our learning comes from autistic people, or the most important learning comes from autistic people. Well, you say something in Uniquely Human. Uh, in fact, it's almost the core mission statement of Uniquely Human in a way. And it, it recapitulates virtually the main lesson that I learned uh, by writing Neurotypes. You say something like that the problem with so many people who do early intervention is that they do not strive to learn about the perspective of the person sitting in front of them, the autistic person. Instead, they try to manage the behavior. And when I started thinking about autism, it was framed fully within what disability activists call the medical model. Autism was a disease, basically. And in fact, I remembered, I remember having a, a very <laughs> angry argument with the editor and former editor in chief of Wired, Chris Anderson, who in 2001 wanted to call my article the geek disease. Hmm. And uh, I, I begged him to change it to syndrome and he wouldn't, he wouldn't listen to me. And I finally proved it to yeah. him. I said, dude, I went to the autism society of America's website or something like that. Looked for the word disease. It does not appear. So, you know, the data driven argument, I think he was slightly on the spectrum himself, to be honest with you, the data driven argument won the day. And so it was the geek syndrome. Thank God I would have been apologizing for the title for the rest of my life, you know, yeah. but yeah. Uh, it was really by hanging out with autistic people, which I did very early on in the research process, because Ari Niemann, the founder of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, invited me to an autistic retreat called Autreat, run by autistic people for autistic people. That experience was like a mental shower that... Uh, washed away all these myths and misconceptions that I had about autistic people. And I remember a very distinct moment when I came back home afterwards, I was sitting in this chair, I was, you know, starting to write for neurotribes and I'm like describing autism clinically. And I, I just stopped myself and I said, Steve, you were just with these people for, you know, a week. They're funny. They're, you know, they're complex. They're, different from each other. They're fully human. Um, they have more to communicate than the world can imagine. Um, don't write about them this way. And so I, that was the turning point when what I tried to do as an author was to strive to understand the perspectives and insights of autistic people rather than just writing about their behavior. When you look back on your process for writing Neurotribes, I mean, it was almost like scientific discovery, it seems like, because your research was the experience, not the what you were perceiving from the outside as the behaviors and the challenges, but the true experience. Is that fair to say? Yeah, sure. And in that regard, I was very much influenced by, I would say, my primary uh, writing mentor, specifically on this subject, who was Oliver Sacks. And if you read his his article about Temple Grandin, an anthropologist on Mars uh, that originally appeared in The New Yorker and then became the centerpiece of a mm -hmm. book. It's all about trying to access her perspective. And it wasn't until I had read literally decades of autism case histories that I realized how extraordinary that article was specifically for that mm -hmm. reason. He was trying to see the world through her eyes which of course was his great gift as both a clinician and a, and a writer. Um, that's why we read him because he built bridges of understanding between the reader and people who have conditions that would normally be considered mm -hmm. either very stigmatizing or sort of horrible tragedies, you know, okay, but what then they're still human beings. They're still creatively trying to move into the next phase of their life whether they, you know, have uh, color blindness or whatever. And so Oliver was always, always put mm -hmm. the patient at the center of his case histories. And in his case, the diagnosis was practically besides the point. What mattered was the experience of being alive from the patient's perspective. 
that was, I would say, the big uh, inspiration. And what I didn't realize until I'd done the research for Neurotribes was how revolutionary that was. Yeah. Because if you read the earlier, you know, if you read stuff by like Ivar Lovas, who founded, uh, you know, uh, ABA more or less, or, uh, you know, applied ABA to autism, um, mm-hmm. it's as if the person in front of him does not have a perspective. You know, he he literally says explicitly, autistic people are not really people. You have, quote, you have to build the person. Oh, really? You know, autistic people had been not just erased from history, but erased from even having selves in all the clinical writing about autism. And it was really the experience of hanging out with autistic people that taught me that they not only had a valid perspective and it wasn't just a constellation of symptoms or, or a list of deficits, you mm-hmm. know, that they had a very human, uh, very complex perspective, just like neurotypicals deserves just as much respect. And so that's what really launched me into um, even writing about case histories in neurotribes. Let me give you one tiny example. Um in Neurotribes, I talk about the very first paper that was written about Asperger syndrome in America. It was written by, I think, Fred Volkmar at the Child Study Center um, in, uh, at Yale. And in it, they talk about this kid, an adolescent boy, who they ask him to describe himself. And he says, I'm vertically challenged. Well, he was making a joke. Yeah. He was saying that he's short. It's funny. Right. You know, neurotypical people say stuff like that all the time. The, what the paper says is, note the over-reliance on technical vocabulary. <laughs> oh, really? Oh you know, God. it's like he was, make, he yeah, was making yeah, a yeah, joke yeah. and the joke was on you guys. Sorry. <laughs> you know? And so I started to read case histories knowing that in, in autism anyway, Uh, The doctor was not always the reliable narrator. Mm. Often, I would look for traces of, you know, what Asperger and his colleagues called autistic intelligence, which is to say not only intelligent, but distinctively autistic. Mm -hmm. Uh, I started to look for traces of that in case histories going back to even before Asperger and Leo Connor. Um, So that, you know, there's this great paper by a woman in Russia named Grunia Sukareva. It's really one of the very first descriptions of Asperger syndrome, but many years before Asperger even started working. Um, The kids are funny as hell. You know, you can tell that she not just empathizes with them, but appreciates their quirky, subversive wit, you know? And so I started to look for traces of, you know, subversive wit, complex feelings, Desire for connection. You know, you say very uniquely human that one of the most important things to do is to seek a connection with the autistic person. Whereas in, you know, half a century of papers before you wrote that book or whatever, the notion, the central notion is autistic people don't care about connection. In fact, they shun it, you know, and I knew that wasn't true. I mean, you know, autistic people crave connection, crave romance, crave sex, you know, and uh, in other words, they're human beings. And uh, that was quite unlike the way they were portrayed. Yeah. I really think uh, the essence of Steve's work uh, falls beautifully in line with ethnographic analyses, you know, that, that you're going in respecting that you don't know the culture, respecting that you don't know what makes these people tick. And of course, you know, your comments about Fred's comment is looking from a neurotypical perspective, a neurotypical centric perspective as to how it's going to be interpreted, because that's what we look for. We look for those strange kind of patterns of behavior, but we're going to amplify everything we see to almost justify our beliefs about that. Exactly. And I think Steve's experiences, early experiences, and my experiences at summer camp, I mean, I worked with people with autism a few years before I was exposed academically to the concept of autism. 
So the same way that you saw, wait a second, you know, this is violating everything I've read or much of what I read about autism. When I spend time with autistic people, I had a number of years of the summer camp experience. And then eventually when I learned about the label and went to parent meetings, the parent experience, of course, behaviorism at that time was like this great founding opportunity to save autistic people. And so much of what I read, as you read, in Lovas and the early, especially radical behavioral literature, it didn't jive with what I was seeing in the kids and in the people. Right, right. And, and I think our naivete going into that and having almost like a, an ethnographic point of view, let's, let's understand we don't fully understand and let's almost be the anthropologists. Yeah. And, but with a respectful eye with the people that we're meeting and spending time with. And then you begin to extract, well, there's a lot of meaning here. And not only that, but yeah. you also easily pinpoint what you've read as violations of what you're seeing. Yeah. But, yeah. but uh, obviously we've seen change in, and in reality, probably the seven years that we put our pens down when the books were complete. Yeah. Um, and you speak about the future of neurodiversity in the subtitle of Neurotribes. What changes have you seen and where do you think we're going? Well, there have been so many changes that um, I could practically pick them at random, which is what I'll do. Uh, but the one thing I will say up front is this. Uh, it is, has, it's a very dark time in American history uh, right now. And uh, it's a very dark time with coronavirus. It's a dark time with politics in America. At the same time, I take comfort in the fact that the neurodiversity movement has already made significant progress just in the last five years and has really changed the way that parents approach autism and has changed the way that young autistic people approach their own autism. One of the most fun things that I've done since Neurotribes has come out is attending uh, meetings by neurodiversity student groups um, at colleges. The pride and confidence and feeling of safety from bullying. and But it's not just like lack of negatives. It's like there's a real positive, you know, mm -hmm. community feeling among young people once they get hooked up with the concept of neurodiversity and then hook up with other neuro neurodivergent people. Um, that's going to be a generation of autistic people who don't take shit, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't, you know, they don't, do not listen to the negative predictions uh, and the limiting predictions for what their lives will be. And they, they are very ambitious uh, for the changes that they seek. Mm -hmm. Something that most people don't know is that the autistic members of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network had input into the current diagnostic criteria for autism mm -hmm. in the most uh, recent version of the DSM. And mm -hmm. to me, that's like, you know, Jewish people being able to weigh in on the Torah, you know, whatever, like, you know it's like they're, they're finally, you know, the people most affected by these criteria get to have some say into, you know, how broad they should be, what, you know, uh, so yeah. that's significant. Also, it's significant that autistic people are going to, uh, you know, the big national conferences on autism science and speaking up. Mm -hmm. I, I remember being told that autistic people did not like to go to these big national autism conferences and because they were tired of hearing themselves described as a burden on their families and, uh, you know, a source of shame and disappointment. Yeah. You know, and uh, so I thought, well, no wonder why autistic people don't come to these conferences. Yeah. But now they do. And they're having input on the research agenda, which I think is really important. This goes beyond like neurodiversity is identity politics or some BS like that. It's better science and it's focusing research funding, which is always scarce, on what autistic people really need instead of how to prevent them from being born in the future. And, and I think a, a big piece of it is undoing the power structures. Yeah. I mean, you know, some the lineage of getting large NIH grants or NIMH grants is 
how many grants you've gotten before or how many publications you've gotten before. Exactly. I do have one more question for Steve, and that is, uh, and this isn't just coming from me, it's coming from so many people out there. Are you working on a new book? Ooh. Yes, I am working on a new book. I'm working on a book called The Taste of Salt, which is a history of cystic fibrosis. Mm. And what I'm attracted to uh, unresolvably complex societal situations. <laughs> and, uh, well, this does not bode well for your husband, by the way. <laughs> right, right, right. But uh, it's going to be another really complicated <laughs> book. But... Uh, <laughs> And, and and Steve, your life expectancy is 175 years. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so I'll try to speed it up a little. You know, I mean, one of the differences between cystic fibrosis and autism is that autism has these all these sort of rabbit holes you can dive mm-hmm. into, and um, so I'm going to try to keep this a tight, you know, almost an adventure story in a mm-hmm. way, like how we learned how to keep people like one of my best friends Mm -hmm. alive uh, into old age. Well, cystic fibrosis is quantifiable, right? It's not a, it's not a subjective diagnosis. So there's a huge difference right there. Yeah, you're right. And thank you for pointing that out actually. Yeah. There's, there's a range of specific mutations that means you have cystic fibrosis. Whereas with autism, who the heck knows right. what genes are? In. I mean, they're starting to narrow it down, but it's still very vague. There's no biomarker for autism. Mm-hmm. It's still a subjective clinical diagnosis. Mm-hmm. So You're looking at it. Exactly. Well, to me, the way that I have changed about my attitude towards autism since 2001, when I first wrote about it, is then I looked at autism as a diagnosis, as a clinical problem, mm-hmm. Uh, a list of traits or behaviors that these people who have autism struggle with. Now I look at autistic people as what a biologist might call a natural type. They're a form of human life that is different from the neurotypical forms of human life, but that is very distinctive. And I'm sure all of us can attest to the fact that once you hang out with a lot of autistic people, you develop, uh, you know, to, bar- to appropriate a gay term, you develop autdar, you know, like gay men can, you know, check each other out in a room and figure out who's gay. Uh, right. That's called gaydar. Yeah. Um, if you hang out with autistic people enough, yeah. you know, I mean, believe me, they're, they're, they're not infrequently times when I'm talking to someone, I think, hmm, this person's on the yeah. spectrum. I wonder if they knew it. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know? yeah. And I don't go overboard. I don't like diagnose every geek with autism, you know. I'm actually pretty conservative <laughs> about mm-hmm. that, but there are a lot of autistic people out there. To me, it's just like a tribe of humanity. Yeah. And, and I think that's why NeuroTribes has such universal appeal. Yeah. Because everybody can think about family members, yeah. can think about friends, whether diagnosed or not. Yeah. 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 Well, f- well, thank you guys so much. And thank sure. you, Barry, for giving a, a gift to the world that oh. uh, is not only still selling well, <laughs> it will <laughs> um, uh, elevate people's lives for long after we're oh, both I can gone. say the same about NeuroTribes. And it's, it's, it's such an honor to share this anniversary. I mean, the anniversary of our books is the anniversary of our friendship as well. So I, I feel great about that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Guys. Thank you, Steve. And it's so awesome that... Uh, we got to have Steve on. Mm-hmm. What were what was one of the things that really stood out for you with this discussion we just had now, where it's you know, neurotribes and uniquely human, say five years later, or in your case, seven years after you were done writing. I, I think what we saw, you know, when we began, began to write it seven years ago, and then when the both books were published, um, what's happening now is, is just kind of. Uh, neurodiversity on steroids. Uh, Mm. I I think we were kind of beginning to see, even though within the autism community, people were well aware of the fact that autism was just looked on too negatively for too long. Yeah. And uh, and I think one of the common threads between neurotribes and uniquely human is, um, you know, to overuse a cliche, we insisted on looking at the cup half full um, and looking at a balanced view of how neurological diversity leads to very 
complex and interesting human beings who have strengths as well as challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Um, God, I could have talked to him for another five hours. Um, hey, should we do our uh, enthusiasm of the week? Uh, t- let's do that. Tell us, tell us what this is, Barry. Why enthusiasms? Yes, because it really challenges a lot of the cup half empty descriptions of autism. When people have spoken about obsessive behaviors, perseverative behaviors as negatives. Yeah. And enthusiasms allows us to turn that upside down and look at the cup half full. What rivets a child's attention? What lights their fire? What enables them to engage with other people when around other topics or other activities they might not do so? So a little bit of history here. Mm. About 15 years ago, in one of our fundraising conferences for our parent retreat, I invited Clara Claiborne Park. Clara is one of the most important people historically in the history of autism. Uh, She did pass away about 10 years ago in her 80s. And Clara was the first parent to write a book about raising a child with autism called The Siege. And at our conference, Clara answered a question about her daughter's enthusiasms. But the question was something like this. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with your daughter's obsessions? That must have been really challenging. And what Clara said was, obsessions? Obsessions? (laughs) Obsessions? <laughs> We've always thought of them as enthusiasms. And what she communicated to this audience of 500 people, most of whom were parents, was that she and her husband always bent over backwards to understand what her daughter Jessie was interested in, motivated by, what she really enjoyed doing. So the term enthusiasms is borrowed from what I learned from Clara. Um, mm. And since that time, other people, um, such as Stephen Shore has spoken about passions. People such as Temple Grandin, of course, has spoken about utilizing a child's strengths and talents. And all of these different descriptions allows us to go down a different path Mm -hmm. rather than pathologizing what we may see in autistic children and autistic people. We think of the possibilities. And of course, that places the obligation back on us. Mm. So I'm thrilled that we will have a mom talking about her son's enthusiasm. And Latrice is the first winner, and her son Terrence is the first winner of our Enthusiasm of the Week Award. Uh, That's right, we received uh, such a nice email from Terrence's mom, Latrice. And uh, do you have it pulled up there, Barry? Uh, I could pull it up, yeah, hold on. All right, so this is what Latrice shared with us about uh, Terrence's knockout enthusiasm. Our son, Terrence Hamilton Jr., is an awesome teen with dynamic boxing skills and a love for life. Boxing and acting out movie scenes as he role plays as Rocky and Creed have been Terrence's favorite coping tools for anger control and emotional self-regulation. He watches all of the Rocky movies, Creed 1, Creed 2, and he loves them. He watches them almost every day, literally. (laughs) He literally acts out all of the screens in full Rocky gear every day. He records these movies on his iPhone and iPad so he can still watch them wherever he goes. It's awesome. This this guy's the real deal. And we have Latrice uh, on the Zoom uh, with us here. She's in Memphis. Latrice, welcome. It's been a few years, huh? I know. (laughs) Yeah, I saw you down in your neck of the woods in Louisiana. You did, and now I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. You're doing some some state hopping there. Yeah, we're here now. <laughs> oh wow, that's I didn't know you two uh, knew each other. That's great. Yes, and and I kind of made the connection because I didn't make the connection initially when I read Terrence's enthusiasm that you wrote about, and then. I, I then I made that connection. I actually found an email that you sent me with a video link. Idea, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we have a, a new segment, and actually, you are the first one to be chosen for the enthusiasm of the week. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. We always call Terrence Rocky Terrence. He <laughs> is always boxing. He um, loves to box. 
I think my husband actually introduced Terrence to Rocky movies. And so then Terrence just kind of developed this thing where he wanted to dress like Rocky. He wanted to be Rocky. And then it led to him like in Creed as well. So um, I think it started out first with was che- teaching Terrence like how to express himself when he's angry or when he's upset. First ah, asking yes. for help or then acknowledging I feel angry or I feel mad or I feel frustrated. And how do I deal with that after I acknowledge it? And so it yes. started out by Terrence asking for like hugs when he felt frustrated. Mm. And then we noticed that he needed a little bit more, something else to help him with his aggression um, and things like that. And so that's when he got heavily like into the boxing. And so we was like, well, Terrence, if you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling overwhelmed, then you can start boxing. So all of a sudden he just developed this thing where he watched Rocky movies all day, every day. <laughs> It could be his worst day because Terrence had seizures. And so we actually made a video of Terrence um, right after he had a seizure. He was able to calm himself down and come back to himself again. He wanted to Mm -hmm. immediately start boxing again. So me and my husband kind of looked at each other like, are you serious? (laughs) You know, like, how do you get this energy to to bounce back that way? And so like the other day, he even made a comment. Well, I'll forget about those seizures. I'm fine. I want to box. You know, (laughs) so. (laughs) Wow. Wow. He just got this resilience um, see in him, this ability to bounce back and this love for just acting out all the Rocky movies, acting out Cree movies, and even asking us, like, Mom, you want to box with me? Dad, let's box. Let's play. That's awesome. <laughs> Jeez, that was that was something else that was so exciting to me. I mean, there's there's so much going on here. The athleticism, the and the the term that you used, and I was so happy to hear you use it, that it helps with his emotional regulation. Mm-hmm. Um but also, um, it's so creative. He's watching movies and he's acting what he sees. Yes. And now he wants to be an actor. So he's awesome. taking acting classes as well. I guess my husband, I would say he's Terrence's trainer. And then Terrence's <laughs> nurse is also his trainer. And then now Terrence also trains us too. <laughs> so, <laughs> now but that I think that may be a great idea to let him see, you know, interact with somebody else that's doing it. And this passion is there as well. Uh, Barry is very deeply involved in um, an amazing project called the Miracle Project. Do you want to talk about that, Barry? Sure. Yeah, the Miracle Project is an expressive arts program and theater program out of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And um, now it's all on Zoom. And uh, we are starting a Miracle Project. We have started a Miracle Project in New England. Um, And it it seems especially... um, for a lot of the kids in the Miracle Project, and I'm also involved in something called the Spectrum Theater Ensemble. Um, I'm on their board, and that's adults. And many of them started by really enjoying to watching movies and then acting out mm-hmm. what they see. So there's, an, so how old is Terrence now? He's 14. He's 14. I mean, there's there's so much potential, um, and so much space to grow into that if you're interested in that. That, that's very, very exciting. He will love that he's already telling me, I'm going to be in Rocky 3, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he'll love that. Anything like that, Terrence, or, or, I'll love it for real. I love it. This is this is fantastic. And and by the way, I'm not surprised at all that he was able to learn sort of the nuances of boxing from watching and absorbing, because that's, that's how I do most of my stuff. You know, if I have to figure out how I need to conduct myself in a meeting, I'll watch the people who clearly go to a lot of meetings and I'll just act and do what they do. <laughs> yeah. so. You know, and, and let's not forget to give big kudos to mom and dad here um, because you saw the seeds of the potential. And I, I'm, I'm just sitting here loving you hearing, saying things like, well, it's a way for Terrence to connect with more people. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the athleticism and just maintaining good physical condition, of course, the emotional regulation, you've identified so many different benefits. And that's what we love when we hear about enthusiasms, that it's not just about, well, he likes to do this or she likes to do this and sits there all day by him or herself doing it over and over again. But I mean, that could be a leisure time activity. Right. But you've identified so many possibilities and that's so exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Well, this is so great. And um, thank you so much for letting us do this. Uh, is is there anything else you wanted to express or share? Anybody that knows Rocky or Cree, say Terrence is your biggest 
fan. He <laughs> dressed in full gear every day. <laughs> every day. I, that's oh devotion. I love it. <laughs> Latrice, as you know, uh, Terrence is in your prize for being named Enthusiasm of the Week is a signed copy of one of our books. And Barry, uh, I have won our first showdown. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the Hamiltons, it's true, the Hamiltons have selected the Journal of Best Practices for the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on the scoreboard of the winners of Enthusiasms, with Latrice being and Terrence being <laughs> the number one winner, the score is one Dave, zero Barry. <laughs> I feel like Rocky already. That's right, huh? <laughs> This was so much fun. Thank you, Latrice. Thank Jeez, thanks you. so much. Nice connecting with you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs> oh, that's so much fun. It, this Terrence knows his way around the ring, too. Um, you know, she, uh, Latrice was kind enough to send us a recording, actually, of Terrence talking about boxing in, in his own words. Uh, check check this out. Why do you want to be an actor? I'm an actor. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite part in the Rocky IV movie. If I can change, you can change. Everybody can change. Yay! What do you like about Rocky and Creed? They're yeah, champion too. So how does boxing help you to calm down when you feel mad? Help me calm down. Help you to calm down. So boxing makes you feel? Good. Good. Does it make you feel happy too? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you, Terrence. Mm. Mm-hmm. Tell me about tell me about the importance of enth- of enthusiasms and and how these help people on the spectrum, help uh, their families, you know, educators, everybody. Yes, uh, we feel that enthusiasms have the potential to contribute in so many ways to a positive quality of life. Um, and as we indicate on our request form on uniquelyhuman.com um, <laughs> we would love to hear about enthusiasms but not just what the enthusiasm is we'd love to hear on how it has enhanced quality of life so let's think about some of the things that Latrice shared um, mm-hmm. one of the obvious points uh, was the physical activity that mm-hmm. he loves the physical activity and it helps him when he's feeling angry emotionally dysregulated and it helps calm him down as well as get the energy out. Right. Was there anything else that struck you, Dave, about what she said? I, I think there's a lot of just really great family moments that have come out of that, it sounds like. Um, that's that's really what struck me, was what it did for Terrence, but what it also did for his family. Yes, and, and, and the obvious pride that she feels in Terrence's accomplishments, um, which is just amazing. And also, even within the artistic medium, now he wants to be an actor, and he says he wants to be an actor, mm-hmm. which is incredible. I mean, he's watching movies. He's becoming an expert in, in, in film right now. And that has expanded to he loves putting his own movies together. And it doesn't have to turn into something that's a career, but it, it, gives, you, it gives you skills. It gives you um, sort of a, an objective, something to accomplish. And that ties back to self-esteem as well. Preteen to to adolescence, that's when your self esteem is going to be rocked. Absolutely, and and I just started reflecting a little bit on some of the unfortunate stories that we hear from, especially autistic adults, when they talk about the things they love to do. Very often, were discouraged when they were young, um, and now he has parents, but not just parents, an expanding network who appreciate what he loves um and for a person to feel good about themselves and connected to other people Mm -hmm. that's an incredible starting point and continuing point when people take pride in what you do and you love doing that you're right right and when you wear it on your sleeve like that too you know the rolling stones uh started because keith richards met mick jagger on a train platform and they got to talking about music. And, mm-hmm. and that's it's the same sort of thing where if somebody like Terrence can be now surrounded, um, or not even surrounded by people, but just have access now to other social opportunities where another kid might say, hey, I, I love boxing, too. Well, now you've just made a connection that's, you know, 
rock solid and probably a very long-term enduring one as well. Absolutely. And, and, you know, even taking it a step further, and I don't know if this is happening with Terrence, but, you know, I would encourage reading about boxing, writing stories about maybe boxing and characters, and then extending from there. And my point is that so often people say, how can academics be functional and relate to a child's life and what the child knows and wants to learn about? And you could even think about the potential for kind of boxing being a core to stretch out from in terms of even working on academic skills, literacy skills, and so forth. There's this harmony, you know, in the body. There's a there's a like a physical mental coherence uh, that occurs when you're moving your body and mm-hmm. you're thinking. And mm-hmm. so all of this activity, then I would imagine, also just lights up his brain for academic intellectual work as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let let's look at it through um, his parents' perspective. What are some benefits? Uh, to the parents when when children have these very deeply rooted uh, enthusiasms? I, I think it gives the parents, especially parents who've heard kind of the doom and gloom early on, mm. and they hear, you know, what we refer to as the can't do checklists. Here are the things your child can't do, and here are yeah. the things that you shouldn't expect in your child's life. Uh, um, yeah. What it does is it just totally counters those narratives. It's look, look what he can do. Um, and again, for Terrence, he's well down the path. It's not just that he has these brief periods of imitating Rocky. I mean, he's making films, you know. Yeah. He, he and knows. it's every day. He dresses full gear, you know. Absolutely. And, and now he's inviting other people to kind of engage with him in it. So when a parent sees that, it's the counter narrative to the cup half empty description of autism. Right. You know, the other thing I think about, especially in this day and age, is that with Terrence being a young African-American young man, um, mm. think about the role models like uh, Joe Lewis, you know, oh, uh, Muhammad yeah. Ali, um, the role models that he could look up to. I mean, it's interesting that I guess initially he chose Rocky, but then Creed came into the picture. Uh, so, so it's wonderful that... In this case, we all want role models who we can relate to more closely. And in this day and age, we know that too often when we talk about kids of color, that we don't hold up the role models for them. Um, And in a sense, we now see Terrence being able to choose his role models based upon the movies that he sees. I'm sure he just adores Creed. Oh, absolutely. And seeing not only the boxing aspect of it, but the role models for acting, for mm-hmm. um, film production, you know, when, you know, to be able to see yourself reflected in who your role model is, is um, uh, really important. Mm-hmm. What about the other side of that, where you've got a single parent um, and uh, the challenges are, are a bit more significant uh, with his or her child? And maybe they maybe they just don't have the time or even the financial resources to really indulge have you seen families that were able to still make room for these even though their family situation uh, didn't really allow for a lot of time and and focus on a particular activity um yeah i've heard of stories where um especially for a teenager where somebody mentored them in a particular activity based upon and enthusiasm um, and would come and pick up the young man or the young woman and take them to an activity uh, and the parents would not have to be responsible for organizing all of that, which really does lead us to another point and that is an enthusiasm could lead you to kind of an after school, you know, post COVID anyway, an after school group (laughs) activity with other kids who have similar interests. So whether it be a Lego club, you know, a chess club, whatever, an activity that that young man or young woman can join other kids and they can share their enthusiasms. So it could be a connection, um, a social connection in ways other than just sitting together in school. Right, right. Um, And it also gives the parents uh, some 
some insight into who the other like-minded parents might be in their community, other parents who would just get their kid. Yes. You know, and the old story of a kid who really has a passion and, and an enthusiasm about something and wants to talk about it a lot, that might be interfering in some settings, but you put them in a club and they want to yeah. build Legos to talk about that. They might be the most accomplished kid in that club. And everybody admires that child or that young man or that young woman because they're so knowledgeable. Absolutely. You know, I, I'm tempted to ask you the question, well, gee, Barry, what should parents do if they feel that their child has some great uh, enthusiasm? That, that answer is going to be different for every child in every family situation. Yes. But uh, what you're hitting on here is, uh, indulge it. Go ahead. Like, see what, see where it leads to, but maybe go at the child's pace. Yes. Yes. We actually, I actually wrote an article with the dad a few years ago, <laughs> hitting on some of those points. Um, and, mm. and you just hit on two or three major points that the dad shared. Um, see, great minds think alike. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, what the dad shared was, you know, especially family members or parents is, you know, look for the potential, be accepting. If you see the seeds, provide the opportunities for that enthusiasm to grow. But don't say, oh, this will be a job for him or her one day, or we can lead this into a job. Um, don't expect it's always going to be there because sometimes enthusiasms come in phases and then leave, but sometimes they last for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and so a, a piece of it is don't make it evaluative in the sense that we're going to make judgments about, you know, what can we do with this enthusiasm? And if my son or daughter doesn't get there, I'm going to be disappointed. Um, exactly what you said. Go at the child's pace, create the opportunities, and it's not about your goals. It's about how the enthusiasm can improve quality of life, improve relationships, improve trust in other people, and just have fun and be joyful. Have fun, be joyful, and improve quality of life. Those are the three things that, when I think about, can you take an enthusiasm too far to the point where it becomes less healthy, less productive? Those are the those are the sort of uh, markers that you're looking for in the waters. You know, to keep your boat between these markers, right? Like, don't don't let it go too far um, to where. Uh, they can't socialize um, because all they're thinking about is wanting to do this thing. So um, it, I think if it's improving your quality of life, if it's um, creating opportunities for you to uh, make new social connections, give you new life skills, social skills, executive functioning capability, um, then I would say keep doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Time to put you in the hot seat. Uh-oh. We just had uh, a knockout conversation with um, one of the great science writers of our time, uh, Steve Silverman. We just had a lovely phone call with uh, Latrice Hamilton about her son Terrence and his, his boxing and acting enthusiasm. If you had to give us three takeaways for this episode, uh, what do we want the listener to come away with? Take your time. <laughs> I think takeaway number one is we all have different brains and different brains leads to different abilities, different challenges, different enthusiasms. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as we respect that we're not cut out of the same cloth, as long as we don't look at children and people as being homogenous, and that there's such a thing as normal, that allows us to respect the differences that we see in people and allows us to build upon the strengths um, mm -hmm. and also allows us to understand that everybody's just not gonna be so great at some things. And I, I think another important takeaway is that we learn best, we grow best, we want to connect most when we're involved in things that we love to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in some cases, we may do them in a solitary way. In some ways, we may do that in sharing it with people or both. And isn't life and quality of life about 
how much connection and how much joy you experience. It doesn't mean being in the mainstream all the time, because sometimes we feel much better in terms of our own emotional state when we have that space and we have that getaway time. But we have to understand, you know, what really motivates people and makes people happy. Absolutely. Is there a third one? Oh, I, I guess the third one, and let me give, you know, again, a, a, a big, big kudo to Latrice, is mm. the power of parents and caregivers in terms of helping their kids be happy. And sometimes it's not around the most conventional things in the world, um, but really, as we say in Uniquely Human, getting it. And parents who get it, you know, right away we see the family member on the spectrum who is enjoying life, despite some of the challenges that go along with autism, um, and really just wanting to continue to learn and to connect. Well, my friend, uh, another terrific episode. What can I tell you? Um, we want to thank Latrice and Terrence Hamilton for sharing Terrence's special enthusiasm for boxing and all things Rocky and Creed. Uh, Rocky, uh, you are on notice officially. Uh, you have a new contender. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, sardonic, salient, stupendous, stunningly salty Steve Silverman for taking a break from writing his new book to chat about uh, that other thing he wrote. What was it called again? Uh, oh yeah, Neurotribes, the juggernaut global bestseller on the legacy of autism and the future of neurodiversity. And uh, please visit uniquelyhuman.com to share your child's or, or hell, even your own enthusiasm. And uh, you might just be the lucky recipient of a personalized copy of Uniquely Human or the Journal of Best Practices. Uh, right now, the scoreboard is one to zero, Journal of Best Practices. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything you want to add here, Barry? Uh, no, this was just a, a wonderful episode. And um, my excitement is only growing as we continue to um, interview just the most marvelous people in the world that we're all learning from. Right on. Well, let's enjoy this uh, special scene from Rocky IV starring world champion welterweight Terrence Hamilton Jr., uh, along with this uh, fantastic arrangement from Matt Savage. Take care, everybody. You can change. Anybody can change. 